Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Yale University Art Gallery for the keynote lecture for the 2018 Summer Teachers Institute in Technical Art History, or STIDA. My name is Cindy Schwartz. I'm the Associate Conservator here at the Art Gallery. Um, as a way of introduction to the program, every other summer we welcome to Yale 15 art historians and a few chemists um, for a week of study of technical... <laughs> That's you, <laughs> for a week of study of technical art history. And the theme for this year's course is learning through replication. Uh, I'd like to thank the Crest Foundation for making this program possible, and for all of the participants and lecturers for making this a, such a really dynamic session so far. And in particular, I'd like to thank Ian McClure. Is this, did this just stop working? No, no? okay. Ian McClure, Jessica David, and Elizabeth Williams for their work to make this come together. For the l last several STIDA sessions, a contemporary artist has been invited to be in conversation with a conservator who has consulted on the fabrication and preservation of their work. At last year's meeting of the American Institute for Conservation, Suzanne Ciano presented a lecture on her collaborations with Dan Cullen. And when it came time to select a conservator and artist for this year's program, I could think of no better pair. Suzanne Ciano is Chief Conservator and Director of Modern Art Conservation, a large private conservation practice located in Chelsea. Beginning as an apprentice in Florence in 1989, Suzanne went on to earn a certificate in art conservation from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. For 13 years, she was part of the painting conservation team at MoMA, where she developed an expertise in the conservation of modern and contemporary works. She was also associate conservator in two private New York conservation studios before starting modern art conservation in 2007. Today, her team includes six paintings conservators, a sculptor, sculpture conservator, and a support staff of technicians, a photographer, and a registrar. Suzanne lectures extensively on topics such as damage and loss, authentication, disaster planning, collections care, collaborations with artists, modern materials, and conservation of non-traditional materials. Since 2006, she has been an adjunct professor at the Conservation Center of the Institute of Fine Arts, training future conservators in modern and contemporary painting conservation. I'll add that not only is Suzanne's practice known for their innovative approaches to problems, but also being um, one of the most pleasant and supportive places to work in conservation and for having hands down the best holiday party in conservation, <laughs> I've heard. Um, <laughs> Dan Cullen lives and works in New York and at his farm, Sky High Farm, in the Hudson Valley. He's represented by Gagosian Gallery and Leva Gorvi in New York and Massimo Di Carlo in Milan. His exhibition history is distinguished, to say the least, and far too prodigious to list here. Earlier this year, he closed a retrospective of his work titled Dan Cullen, Sweet Liberty, at Newport Street Gallery in London. His work is in such public collections as the Whitney Museum, the Albright Knox Gallery, the Hirshhorn Museum, and the Walker Art Center. Dan graduated from Rhode Island School of Design in 2001, which incidentally was the same year I graduated also in paintings, <laughs> and where we had studios just a few cubicles away from each other. And as a painter and a conservator, watching his career develop as an explorer of materials for the last nearly 20 years has been fantastic. Dan's work and his process begs questions about the nature of painting, the role and control of the artist, and explores deeply personal subjects while holding beauty and humor as close allies in conceptual work that unveils itself slowly upon close inspection. His first exhibition at Rivington Arms in 2003 featured photorealistic, meticulously painted spaces. And he followed that with a long period of material exploration using, you're going to see, such materials as um, bubblegum, flowers, blown glass, electronic components, and in my favorite series, metal studs. But he always kind of circles back to moments of return to painting. His most recent exhibition, Mail Order Mother Purgatory, again heavily featured traditional paintings, making this, I think, a really good moment to discuss his career and his relationship to paint. So finally, let's all silence our cell phones and please welcome Dan and Suzanne. So we're gonna do this in a sort of asking some questions and then letting the conversation flow for now. Good. Okay. So to get us started, um, could you each say a little bit, maybe uh, Suzanne, first about how you came to your profession? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I grew up in New York and was always surrounded by art um, and uh, studied art history um, and thought about becoming an art historian. 
Um, but I was a very sort of crafty, hands-on person doing needlepoint and painting and kind of watching my mom paint with oil paints that she wouldn't let me touch as a child. And I think I just always wanted to be sort of uh, surrounded by interesting, colorful materials, things like that. So I was at Barnard and um, it was right at the time when the Sistine Chapel was being restored and my professor was James Beck. Um, so, uh, who was very much against the restoration. So I got to hear a lot about the controversy, but also learn a lot about the profession. And then I studied with Molly Ferries, who um, teaches or taught at the time a technical art history course. In, it was connoisseurship, but really it was going into the Met and going behind the scenes and using infrared and x-rays and really starting to look at paintings from a technical standpoint. And for me, like, being with art in that way and and like being so close to it and not having a guard and and really looking at at a painting and not just for the imagery but actually to look inside the painting was just like that was it I was done I was going to be a conservator um, and so then I went off to Florence and I did my master's in Renaissance art history and I started working with some conservators there who then said go home and and uh, study you know at a program um, and do chemistry which I had been avoiding but eventually I had to do and you know it was a lot easier to learn chemistry when it related to something that I wanted to do and that I understood like this very practical organic chemistry and chemistry so I did it and I ended up at NYU and then started off in conservation. Um, you know for uh, I think it was just an intuitive kind of uh, uh, journey for me. Um, there was no kind of like uh, really kind of progression. There was no series of insights that led me to uh, decide to be a professional artist. I think by the end of, uh, I always loved I always loved drawing. And in high school, I started taking life drawing very seriously. I, I, I was taking classes at the Art Students League in, uh, in, in New York City and, uh, and in some, <coughs> some other kind of uh, places around. Um, around where I lived and you know I, and I just I, I really really loved it and uh, uh, by the time I was uh, finished with high school um, you know and in in many ways it was like my only my only option kind of but like you know I also uh, was was interested in it I don't think I had any understanding of like what it meant to be a professional artist so there was no like real drive to to do that in a way I guess there was but but I knew that I was like on, on, on a track towards something that felt very kind of natural to me and just like spoke to I guess what you know what I enjoyed doing. Um, was there something about painting in particular that drew you? To well, to I mean, you, it, 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 I mean, this is this is really funny to have a little reunion right. uh, <laughs> together <laughs> over here. Um, yeah, that was uh, so you know like I, I coming into I. I my I grew I I grew up right 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 by right by Manhattan and uh, you know my parents always took me to museums and um, neither of them really kind of grew up with art but they discovered it as adults and my father in particular was like really um, really loved it and kind of shared it with me but um, I really I always I only drew and like I I think you know. Um, uh, I love drawing, and uh, by the time I got to school, uh, the painting department was like seemed like the obvious right. place to go. I, I, like, I, I'm not like t like I'm a bad student, um, and like uh, like I was about to say I don't think they really taught painting well, but like <laughs> I, they probably did. They probably did. They probably were like really yeah, good fair. at it, and I didn't like know how to access a lesson, you know, and like so. You know, in, sc in school, I, I like as soon as I could, I kind of veered away from from kind of like uh, classic brush painting, and 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 had no real experience prior to that, and, and I started spraying, mm -hmm. and like, um, and kind of taught myself how to do that, and so um, uh, by the time I uh, by the time I left school, I really like wasn't comfortable with brushes or with oil paint, and. Um, and I kind of like, I started painting, uh, the first project I did outside of school, after school was spraying, but I got to the point in those, those paintings where I realized that like, I was never very good at spraying, it was like, I kind of figured out how to, how to do what I needed to do, and uh, I got to a point where I just couldn't, couldn't do it with the spray gun anymore, and I 
knew I needed to figure out the brushes. And at that point, I, um, I kind of just like started teaching myself. I'm actually with somebody from my studio and, and uh, he was kind of like asking me about that time. And, and I was telling him I would, you know, I'd go to the Met ever, once a week or I'd go to the Frick once a week, you know, and I would talk to every friend that I could about like, you know, brushes and, 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 and mediums and, and um, you know, I, I, I went back to the Art Students League, but I like didn't have the patience uh, for it. I tried to do some still life painting classes again. Uh, um, the place had like an amazing, it was so old school. So like when I was in high school, it still really had that, like it was all filled of uh, cigarette smoke. And there was just like so many like old, old oil painters there, like all these old ladies. And he had kind of like <laughs> lost that appeal. So, so like it wasn't <laughs> enough to keep me there. They kind of like uh, modernized it or something. But, but yeah, it was really drawing, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Long story short, like I was always drawing and you know, so painting became, became the next uh, obvious thing. And um, you know, like, um, um, but I, I was always looking for something kind of beyond my comfort zone, uh, uh, something outside of my skill set, yeah. some a place to explore is really what I'm always kind of like looking for. So s maybe that's a good segue, Suzanne, to, to talk about sort of the difference between being a conservator of modern contemporary art and how that differs from the traditional techniques that Dan sort of just alluded to, um, and what are some of the unique, unique aspects of being a modern contemporary conservator and, and some of the challenges of, um, of it. Um, okay, so I, I started off as an old master restorer. Um, I don't know if we have slides, but um, I started off as an old master restorer. I um, trained with Diane Modestini, who um, restored the Salvador Mundi, the Leonardo. Um, and I was supposed to be an old master restorer, and I loved those paintings, and I loved working on them. I loved making what you all made today, which I was looking at, these little panels with gesso and imitating um, old master techniques. But then I ended up going to MoMA for my internship, and I thought I'd go for a year, and then I stayed a very long time and became a modern person. And what appealed to me so much, even though I had a lot of background um, as an art historian in, in modern, I wrote my bachelor's thesis on Cindy Sherman. I trained with a lot of really great art historians. I didn't think about doing it as a conservator because no one teaches that. And, and still today, and we've yeah. been talking about this, I'm the only teacher of modern and contemporary painting conservation, like practical conservation, in any of the programs here in the States. Um, so it's not something that they teach to you, so you have to kind of go out and learn it. And so I went to MoMA thinking I would just go for this one year, and I loved it. It was... Um, not just being with all this art at MoMA that I grew up with and being able to sort of walk into the room and have the dance, like Matisse dance, like there. You know, it was amazingly moving, but at the same time, there's just so many materials that uh, made every day interesting, every project interesting. And starting, you know, kind of with Cezanne, you have this real change in art and how artists thought about art. Um, you know, he didn't varnish his paintings and considered that finished, right? And that was a new thing at that time. And then um, you have, you know, Picasso working with industrial paints like Ripolin. You have Pollock working with, you know, enamels and dripping the paint. And you have Warhol working with acrylic. So you, you have to figure that out every time you have an artwork to work on. What are these materials? What did the artist use? And that made it very interesting every day. Um, also, you know, at a certain point, you're working on the art of the living artist. Right. And so that brings a, or, or with a, um, a foundation or an estate that has a lot of information about that artist. So you can do a lot of interesting research and then you can actually meet the artist. Um, and that can you know, inform your treatment or what you're going to do. Um, so it's actually just really fun to do every day. It can be difficult and some days I'm working on crazy things. And the reason I have this slide is because you know one day I could be looking at you know, the starry night. Right. But then there are days when I'm working on, you know, butterflies or this is a piss painting by Warhol, which is really just dried urine on a canvas. And, you know, when I got that painting from the Warhol Foundation, everyone thought, oh, how could you be with that? But I had babies and diapers <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm fine with this. And, you know, you have to figure out how to get that to stick on a canvas and stretch it and put it out in the world. Um, and. <laughs> It's a little weird, but it's actually very interesting and uh, challenging every day. So it never gets boring. Yeah. yeah good. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, I left you with that. <laughs> so Dan, can can you describe a bit your studio practice? I know you work with 
assistants and fabricators, and of course you work with Suzanne, and so can you kind of talk about your studio practice, your process, and, and kind of how those different people fill different roles? How is your conservator different than you know, your, your assistants? Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, it's been developing ever since we went to school together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even for my senior project, I had a friend that helped me finish, finish the paintings. Um, again, like I'm usually working outside of my comfort zone. I'm like, I'm interested in what comes out of like a kind of hyper-focused, intense exploration. And like, I'm interested in kind of like exploring like mastery or virtuosity, but really kind of like I'm just as interested in failing. And um, <clears throat> so I love working with experts in different fields and, and, um, and um, to, you know, help me conceive things, to help me, to help me kind of like technically uh, finish things, to help me maintain things. Um, and, you know, my studio coming out of, uh, you know, this kind of undergrad program we went to together has always incorporated uh, people working side by side with me on on paintings it really it really started as just like a very kind of simple out of a simple necessity I mean in school it was about time but um, but uh, early on in my practice it was really about like uh, like needing to get wet into wet onto a canvas in a certain amount of time and you know I could I could only go for so long and so I started you know once the canvases got too big I started bringing somebody next to me um, I think maybe the most relevant part of it here is, you know, like, because there's just so many different relationships that I have, and I really, really, like, they, 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 infor they all inform the work, they all help the work develop, you know, uh, dialogues that Suzanne and I have had have really kind of, like, <coughs> you know, changed the direction more subtly because we're kind of, like, at a la later stage of the work, and more often when it, like, when I was, like, I thought it may have been done, or I'd hoped it had been yeah. done, but uh, um, that kind of idea had been challenged, maybe, and, um, um, but, um, yeah, I, um, you know, I think m maybe what's unique to the way in which I work with people is how open my kind of, like, dialogue is and how kind of porous, like, my, uh, filtration system is in a way. And, like, so I think where it's kind of most dynamic is in my studio with the people that actually work for me. And, um, you know, I kind of moved, making o o a kind of a finer, finer, more kind of classically based oil paintings with uh, with uh, with assistance was really really challenging for yeah. me. You know, it's like it's the dialogue. Of, I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like for you, for for you guys. I can a little bit, but like you know, it's just like what a brush stroke is. The amount of pressure you put into your brush, the amount of oil you put into your paint. There's just like it's so fine. You know, all of these things, and so to kind of talk <coughs> talk to people you know, talk people through, you know, the kind of like effects I'm trying to get for each layer and how I'm trying to build up the paint is, is really challenging and you need somebody with a very kind of uh, refined uh, vocabulary for it. And, you know, and you also need somebody that, that like uh, uses the same words and, and sees things in the same way, ways as you do, you know, it's not even about talent, it's really kind of like about, um, about a kind of chemistry. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I found great relationships, but like it was, I, I, a lot of them were frustrating, you know, and, and I've kind of like worked with some people who, who are very, very talented and, and, I, and I've trained some people to kind of like work really well under me. Um, but when I broke out into the, you know, I, I, to, to, I, I, don't, I could get kind of like caught up in it, but to try to s put it most simply, I really started all the material exploration because like I had, I had a, uh, had not been getting what I wanted out of out of the oil paint out of the oil paintings and like in particular not getting what I wanted out of the way in which I understood the viewers were kind of digesting the work and what well, how they understood what my intentions were which I, was like kind of a weird frustrating part of my early career and I, I decided like I, I, I didn't I didn't have enough intentionality behind using oil paint in a way and it didn't connect enough to the content I was using and to the processes I was using. It was just like more of an obvious decision, too obvious. And so I decided to, st I wanted to kind of like explore more material and try to align it more uh, with the, the, you know, it was like more, s it, was, it was came out of a searching for the kind of like the source of the potency of the art. Is it, is it in the selection of material? You know, is it in the selection of the content? 
And when I started using this experimental material, the material really took over, you know, and I understood that it was about the material, and it made it much easier to allow the people I worked with to explore the material because I knew none of us were in control of it. And uh, I guess I probably had a sense that oil paint was similar to that, but like I, 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 I was I kind of like, I'm scared of oil painting yeah. because of all the history. That's really what it is. It's like I have so much fear when I'm in front of a painting that like I'm not going to live up to, you know, or that there's just no point, you know, like because it's been done so well for so long. And so, so you know, 10 years later, I'm, I'm much, you know, I'm much more confident that like when I select oil paint and when I kind of select traditional techniques and I, 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 I like I match it with certain pro uh, ways of using it and, and certain imagery that there's a real point to that, you know, and I have a lot more confidence allowing the people that are helping me make those paintings explore that material mm -hmm. the of you know explore oil paint like we we have with the with the gum and like it's like a new reverence for the material really saying like this is a po this is a powerful material it does so many things like that 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 some things i know and some things i don't know and i need to discover more things and the things that i do know i need to have like a real kind of respect for like using because they've been used for so many years um so um yeah so um, back to Suzanne, um, when you're working with a living artist, like, I feel very strange about this term, yeah, living artist, living, when we're like, like, like <laughs> we're okay. anticipating Dan's death yeah. or something. No, but no. <laughs> Could be any day. No, you never know. please no. Um, <laughs> While I have him here. <laughs> <laughs> right. So can we talk a little bit about your role in working with a living artist and and where is that line between something that's damaged versus something that's changed and, and how your conversations with a living artist can, can affect how you approach the thing? Uh, as a conservator, I think um, we, you know, it's great to have a living artist if you're allowed to talk to that artist. And there's a lot that goes on in the art world um, that often prevents you from doing that. And that could happen in a museum or with a private collector or anything. Um, often it's because, um, there have been times when artists have come in and changed a work that has been damaged, right? It's not about the change. We're not talking about that yet, but like a work that's damaged, often an artist will come in and maybe it's 20, 30 years after they made that artwork and their head is somewhere completely different and they could come in and completely change that work. So there's that worry. There's the concern, and I don't know if people really know that much about conservation, but our goal is always to use reversible materials as much as possible. An artist usually comes in with the same materials that he or she used in the artwork. Those materials are not going to age the same way. You know, over time, the original and the restoration is going, they're going to age differently and you won't be able to take that off. It's also very difficult when you know that the artist did that restoration to remove it, um, it, it not just physically, but to then say, I'm going to intervene and take this off. So it's complicated bringing in a living artist in some circumstances, but when the work is just made and you're working with someone you you know you have a relationship with, um, it's it's amazing and it's very interesting because you know one we have to decide what is damage. Um, sometimes it's a tear and obviously that's a, a different kind of damage than change to an artwork. When there's change, you know some artists are fine with change, some artists are not at all. Um, some artists want their works to look exactly the way that. They look the day they were made and to stay that way. Others can live with a little aging, but not that much change. So we have to kind of gauge that when we go in and decide what we're going to do for a treatment. And that treatment is never just the decision of the conservator. It's rare that it's just us. It's going to be whoever is the owner, which I say is really just the temporary caretaker for the work. Um, you know, the artist, if we have a living artist, a foundation, an estate, a curator, you know, there are just many voices in figuring out what the right thing to do and the right place to take that artwork back to and what kind of, say, images we might have for something that is, you know, if there's not a living artist, what the work looked like before this damage. But when we work together, and I think what's come up for me working with Dan is that there, there are different levels of acceptable change. And some are due to the inherent changes of the material, some are due to the environment causing those changes. And we have to figure out, and we have over time together, I think, figured out that sometimes those changes are brought on by someone not taking care of the work correctly, and others are just the sort of natural life of an organic material and, and what he kind of imagines will happen or hopes will happen and people who 
buy that art or who, who take care of that art need to understand that. So a lot of what we do together is, I think, try to inform people about what is okay and, and what um, they shouldn't freak out about, but uh, also how they shouldn't, and you'll see some images, but how they should take care uh, of art, the parameters of what can make that art last longer, what can make his art last longer. Yeah. So maybe, can we talk maybe specifically about those parameters and some kind of projects you've worked on together? Actually, if you go back one go back slide. One. Sure. Uh, oh, two, sorry, two. two. So this is actually, these are some of your works in uh, in my studio um, as we worked on the Magistrate Judiciary. So this is like, we are like another set of hands all um, working on many things, and there's Dan sa signing one of his paintings actually in the studio. But um, but this one at the at the top here is what we'll, you'll see in, the, in that slide coming up. Okay. Um, and was it there before? Was it was it in your studio, sort of? It was after after <laughs> after what you will see. Yeah, yeah. Some of those are sorry. You can go back. I'm sorry about that. That's um, right. What you're looking at is, um, and well, we're going to talk about them more, but um, some things we ended up working on after they were first made, and then we started working together on newer versions of things that he was making. But the very first project we did is this lower one, which is a tar and feathers painting, where um, it's how we met um, through the gallery, uh, through Gagosian. I but think we have some we, images we, um, Yeah. That yeah, you'll see it. that yeah, coming up soon. Really hop around here yeah, now. I think there's all but the last we, images. Oh, yeah, perfect. sorry, we have a lot of sorry. slides to show what? you. But there what? you go. <laughs> um, we worked on these because there had been some issues with uh, the the paintings, but um, which we were able to solve. Which um, they just had been wrapped badly, and had one of them had some mold. So that's what that little picture is. But when we got these paintings, we didn't know Dan, and we realized that the the, the materials he was using, which is a lot of tar and these feathers, and they're very beautiful paintings. They're very three dimensional. They were very heavy for the stretchers that they were on. And when he made them, you know, the stretcher maker doesn't always know what's going to happen on the canvas that he has stretched. Um, so we recommended a change, you know, and we, we had your assistants came at the time and we talked about, you know, that maybe we should put it on a new stretcher that is a different design and, um, and loose line them. And in the slide before, we're, we're transferring over um, the, the, this very heavy painting, which you can't put face down because you have this, like, very all these feathers and things. We're transferring it, and that shiny material is just helping us slide it over, and then we'll slide out the, take out that, that Dartek, which is that material. But it was the, one of the first things we did was just to sort of help make something a little sturdier, you know, so because we knew they would go out in the world and, and be, you know, handled a lot and hung, and our concern is always, you know, to help things that are going to travel or be in different environments than where they're made. So that was, that was, that's what that is. And that's like, I mean, just uh, one question that just came up. So the, the picture of the gum, which I guess we'll talk about, that picture is probably from 2015 and the corner of them working on it. The painting was made in 2010. So yeah, this is so five this years this after, is after it was okay. made that they've, yeah. that they've uh, played with it. And uh, yeah, you know, just b before we right, get into the, the more kind of complex part of our relationship, it has been a really important part of our relationship. You know, what I mentioned before is just this idea that like, and in particular with the materials that like, you know, these are explorations. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it needs to be experimental. And probably the, when I started the tar and feather, I was, uh, you know, I had a bucket of tar and a pillow of feathers. And I was like, kind of like, you know, just like sprinkling the material on there. But by the time that painting was made, and it was very little, um, like, 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 uh, um, very little extra consideration beyond that starting point that I just described. I had like called a tar truck, which comes with like <laughs> thousands of pounds of <laughs> steaming tar, and you shoot it out of like a hose, and it's like there's no controlling it. We had like, oh, it's like a ridiculous situation. But um, sorry, I can't. Can they barely, were not like, fussy thinking, paintings. Thinking, <laughs> thinking about it is, uh, I've never really kind of like thought of how quick that progression was, but I mean, this is like a <laughs> huge truck with like, um, you know, it's like made for, to, to pave roads. So, so, but I need that space, you know, like, and um, to do that and, and um, you know, um, to have people who can kind of come in afterwards and really kind of consider, uh, you know, now how, now how do we make this thing last? You know, we, we, we ha uh, there's a, 
another body of material work which which came up uh, the of these metal stud paintings and Suzanne has also like you know the, the, they they weighed a lot of it has to do with like even just like it's just so hard to imagine that like you can kind of like use this this like this kind of flimsy material and let it build up so much till these things weigh hundreds or or even more a thousand pounds or something like that is like really hard to imagine and so, um, you know, we had a stretcher bar collapse in a collector's house from the metal studs. It just literally broke. Um, and sometimes I like to yeah. pretend it's like a kind of part of the. <laughs> um, but uh, with yeah, that one, I, I kind of like had to, uh, I had to, uh, <laughs> yeah, I had to give in. And uh, yeah, no, so, so it's uh, really yeah. helpful to like have somebody to work with on just those kind of simple things. Then it gets like a little more complex as we right. get into these works. So we'll talk about all these yeah. works if we want. Um, sure. So uh, if we could, so this is this is a very large gum painting, um, and actually the video comes a bit later. We'll show you a video. I think the video is right after this. Is it? Uh, is uh, it? Or, or it's one or two right after. Yeah. Maybe it's in a little bit. Well, yeah. you, maybe we just talk, talk. about. Uh, yeah. So, do you want to talk about how you? So the gu he's very well known for these gum paintings. I mean, as many of you know. So maybe you should just talk a little. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the gum? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, I think you know, like the important stuff I kind of mentioned, um, in particular with these paintings. Um, I started them at the same time. Basically, when I kind of broke off into these material ex uh, kind of uh, uh, non-traditional material paintings, I um, there were two bodies of work that I started at once. One was the gum paintings, and one was a a series of oil paintings, actually, that I call bird shit paintings. And um, like the idea for both of them came at the same time because I was working on these sculptures that, um, that they, were, they were these trumpeloy sculptures. Uh, uh, they looked like uh, big boulders that were covered in bubble gum and uh, bird shit. And it was all trumpeloy. There was no real material. Um, and when I was done with the, the works, there was something about the bird shit, like making, like, uh, trying to figure out how to make convincing looking bird shit out of oil paint and um, and trying, and I was using a gel medium uh, with oil paint on top of it to try to make this like chewed up, stuck on bubble gum look convincing. And um, uh, after I was done with the sculpture, I was left just with this, with this um, kind of uh, excitement to continue pursuing those two things on their own uh, as, as paintings, but like they were out, like, as works on canvas, I should say, because uh, they were, you know, sculptural in in uh, in kind of character and and uh, kind of like the uh, the discoveries I had to make were all or the you know it was all it, it was it was all kind of sculpture sculpture thinking. I just happened to be using uh, a canvas instead of a pedestal basically to build on top of, and um, because uh, you know the burget and and the gum were both. R realistic in scale and and um, and kind of texture, and so um, it, it, I kind of went back and forth, and eventually decided that I would I would sculpt the bird shit with the oil paint and uh, or paint it, but again, like it's kind of three dimensionally accurate, so it really is like a little more like sculpture. And then I would just use the gum, and you know the the the, the oil paintings ended up looking more like something in the natural world and the bubblegum paintings looked more like a classic painting, you know, and I was interested in that, in that dilemma, you know, which really, I was, I've always been interested in Trump Loy, um, and uh, just illusionism and, um, you know, uh, the, um, so, so I started making these paintings with bubblegum and you can see it's a lot of, it's like all bubblegum. We, we, we kind of, yeah. uh, you know, it's, again, I started out just by like kind of chewing a piece of gum and sticking out a piece of canvas and not too quickly with this. It didn't happen uh, like with the tar and feather, but a couple of years later I was, um, you know, and, and this is a, like, I think a, a, a like a, a, some, uh, somewhere where Suzanne had a, had a really big impact on a work at, a, at an earlier phase of it. I, th I think it was your idea to, for us to start microwaving. The, <laughs> yes, Because we were like, I, I literally had, I, I had slide. people chewing a lot of gum at yeah. first, and <laughs> we did that for a few years, and, and then we started boiling it, and like kind of like mat, like it was almost like dough, like we would like use hot water to kind of turn a bunch of, but it was still like really time consuming to even do, you know, uh, small amounts. And eventually, uh, you, Suzanne uh, was, uh, started talking oh. to uh, our studio about. Um, we started using microwaves, and it really changed yeah. the, the 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 the. It changed kind of like how the the possibilities of the project and. 
Can I? So I, so yeah. I just want to say, so when we met, uh, it was there was a gum painting that had some issues, and and um, when I was learning about the process, first I go in and I see all this gum, and it's like being in like a candy store, and oh my God, every kind of gum I ever imagined, and I had no idea that they were like really just ordering and finding every every gum, every color, and they had it all sort of cataloged, and it was amazing to see this sort of, you know, kind of technical side of, of the gum paintings, and I knew that some had been chewed, and then I saw how they made it by boiling, and I thought maybe the introduction of the water was an issue, so it wasn't that I was just like, oh, you should try microwaving. I was thinking about how, like, that was maybe a problem in how the gum would age and what was happening to the gum, and then we had this... So I made gum with our with my son, with my kids. Well, I think also the first problem was that they were oozing. And yeah, I think yeah, that's what you had. And so out so the, she was yeah. asking me about it, and I was saying, well, telling her we made it. We were adding more, more, more moisture, more moisture liquid. And she was like, well, how do, how do you, how can you do right. it without adding more? But for like a little time, when I made that gum with my kid, I thought, okay, well, you know, you get this kit, and you have gum base, and you have all these things. Like, oh, he could just make the gum without the sugars and just color it and do all these things. And I wrote to him. And I said, you know, I think this is probably not what you're going to want to do, even though I'm going to give you this idea, because, you know, it's probably about the Hubba Bubba, which is, you know, this popular gum brand. And he's like, yes, it's about the Hubba Bubba. <laughs> um, and that when he chooses a material, and here he calls it unstable, but I think that we have now changed from unstable to just, you know, unusual or untraditional, um, that he commits. And I, so at that point, I was like, I'm not going to change what you're using and I'm not going to try and I never really try at this point to say like oh you know instead of this you should you be using that because this is his art and it's fine with me I just have to work with it but part of making that gum was actually microwaving the base and I was like hmm this could work and we talked about it and then the next slide will show that yes it, well this oh. is actually the, the gum but the, there will be some microwaves coming up um after a little oh, bit this later. this is the, the oozing, I think, right? That's the yes, these are our yeah. are, are, um, works that, that started to ooze, and right, some of that happens initially when the works are made, but then some of it was happening because of poor care, I want to say. Well, and uh, maybe just uh, I could say a little bit about just my f feelings about kind of all this stuff in terms of change or... Um, if you go back to, go back. Or, I think there's, uh, yeah. Or... Um, uh, damage or you know like the um, and before we get into all the other works because I think it's relevant um, you know my um, I mean just just to kind of this is kind of I think it's all pretty obvious and um, uh, probably to this group in particular but just to give an artist's perspective um, you know uh, and I just had this experience today which is making me think of it but like Almost without fail, every museum visit I go to, the most exciting moment are the Mondrians. You know, it's like, it's just like every time, every time, they're the best. Like, I don't know what it is, they're just so good. And they're all so fucked up. You know, like, and they look like they got fucked up like a year after he made them. It just looked like he had no clue of what he was doing. And I don't know if they were better then. I don't know if they're better now. I don't know if they're getting better or worse, but they feel like they could have never been better than today in this museum, you know? Um, and it's not subtle. Like, it's not even almost subtle. You can imagine what they used to look like. You don't really know, but, but like, m more not imagine to experience what they used to look like, just to imagine how much different they are now. Like, it's very clear. And I, like, I just, I had an experience just looking at the one today, which, there's a beautiful one. It's like uh, the one most to the right. It's really, really, really nice. And like, uh, you know, he has, he does the great signature always. And, um, and in one of the black bars, there's like three or four cracks. I mean, there's cracks everywhere, but <laughs> there's these three or four that really kind of stand out. And there are these four parallel vertical cracks. They're kind of like the same scale and spacing as the lettering of his signature. And through the cracks are the red lines, which are like really the exact same scale. They have as much of, they have as big a part, they're currently like as active a part of the painting as his signature is, which is a big part of the painting, you know, like, um, and they're beautiful, you know, like, and they are the painting. Like, they weren't the painting and now they are the painting. And you know, like, um, you know, 
we die, things change. That's like what happens. Paintings change, um, and like, and I think you know, art is like an important place to explore all of these, all of these like unnegotiable ideas. You know, like, and um, art is also this other place where people invest millions and millions and millions of dollars, and they and they want to pretend like certain realities don't exist. And that's fair. When you spend that much money, you know, we <laughs> um, you can kind of like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you feel like you deserve that sometimes. But, um, but so in, in that is like a really kind of complex situation. And, 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 I, like, and I think like I, I, I often would rather not talk about it, but uh, the, the, the more, you know, as I, as I uh, get to be a professional, like, a, uh, you know, a, a, a professional artist for longer and longer, it becomes more and more complex trying to protect my artistic vision and trying to protect my career and trying to protect my relationships. And, you know, there's like, you know, negotiations that have to happen, uh, you know, regarding something that like, I, I, you know, the most basic idea of was that it was like, you know, this very, uh, you know, it's like um, this, uh, pure, you know, act, and, and, and it still is. It just, like, exists in a, in, in a context that, like, I have a better understanding of now. Mm -hmm. Anyways, the, you know, the Mondrian is, like, I think a really, a really yeah. interesting, like, way to look through it, and I know that, like, it's used in many other, I feel like I read, like, a Jameson essay about it, and, and you know, like, it's, like, a good, it's just a great example for kind of thinking about fakes and aging and damage and all this stuff. But, like, for me, potency, like, is the most is is my that's what I'm curious that's what I'm interested in I'm interested in like how the impact of the art get comes to be and I believe that like as I as I talked before like a lot of it comes through the dialogues that I have with other people around me you know I think the other people around me add to the potency I think discoveries that other people make or that I make with other people adds to the potency um, and then I'm forever trying to discover whether it's, is it the potency in the material? Is it in my ideas? Is it in my, uh, you know, handling of it? And so um, when I started making these works, um, like I think that the quote, that, that email that Suzanne shared um, is, uh, you know, like I was making paintings out of bubble gum, you know, like that's like, that, that's like what I wanted to do. That's like, I, I didn't want to make paintings that look, like I described to you, it was like, I, I decided to make paintings that looked like bird shit out of oil paint and, and to make paintings of bubble gum that maybe looked even like oil paintings. But regardless, it was never to try to, try to figure out how to preserve bubble gum or make some, a painting look like it was made out of bubble gum that lasted forever. It was like, make a painting out of bubble gum, which I don't know what that means, you know, like, and, but I know that, like, uh, you know, once I'm done applying the bubble gum to the canvas, that, like, that's not the end of it, you know? And I know that that's true with, um, with my oil paintings also, but, like, in a kind of much more, um, um, just, like, a much more extreme way. And so, like, like, with these works, I knew when I started them that, and, and you know, again, like, I think that we, we thought to talk about the way I work with, with, um, people in my studio and outside because it's like like I'm not making all the decisions you know like things are happening that are beyond my control I mean even when, even when I'm working in a, in, a, in, a, in a closed room by myself things are happening beyond my control like I know that and that's the beauty of it that's what I love I'm trying to witness things and I'm trying to capture things that I didn't think of or that I didn't that I didn't um, uh, you know uh, m you know make happen whatever so um, you know, it, these were about bubble gum. I knew things would happen. I knew it would get hot in a room and, and it would change. I knew the sun would hit it and it would change in a different way than it does oil paint. I know that all those things affect oil paint also and I knew these would, this would be affected differently. And you know, they're alive. And, 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 and I love the fact that, you know, all art in a sense is. And, and um, so all these things um, could happen. And I think here's a pretty good example of what happens. Um, and. Um, you know, but, but uh, you know, then kind of fast forward a few years later and, and um, you know, it becomes problematic, you know, and with people owning things and they don't feel, they don't, they don't like, just because they bought a painting made of bubble gum doesn't mean that they believe in the same things that yeah, I do, I guess. Yeah, they ask, they always ask me, is it really bubble gum? And I'm like, it's really bubble gum. Can you, can you do something to, to stop this? And like, there's not, this is bubble gum. But actually, this is an interesting one because this came to us because some pieces had detached, but it was in a frame, and we had the pieces, and when we went to put them back where they belonged, 
we got a high res picture of the painting. Um, and somebody else had moved a lot of pieces to different places. So we very carefully, like it's always a puzzle, um, you know, went and put them back as best we could. We don't, we don't replace lost gum, we don't. But we, we reconfigured it back to the way that it had looked. Because you know, if we can keep it looking at least sort of the right way, but it's kind of funny, people are just like, oh, I'm just gonna stick it back on. And, um, and this is a, another example of that where this, this is, a, we don't have an image of the whole painting, but it's a very large work with very heavy gum. Um, and some of it had come off. And we had talked about whether or not the studio should come in and, and redo some of the lost areas, but we had all the gum, so we, we spent a lot of time with these amazing photographs that the studio takes, and for a conservator to have like great images is amazing. And we would sit with the, you know, an image of what it looked like before, we'd find the piece, and they, were, they had sort of kind of gathered at the bottom of a travel frame. It just had been in a very hot, um, and humid environment, and that happened. And we reconfigured everything to look ex as close as possible. And we figured out what adhesive to use, and we put things back that we can. But if it's not there, we're not putting it back. And we do have one, we came across one painting where some other conservator had like recreated gum out of gesso and in painted it, um, which of course didn't look right, but also it, it didn't age with the gum. So it was like a whole different color by the time you know, we got it. It was just this line of red when all, everything else was sort of naturally changing to a different tonality. Um, so we're, we're good sorry. with that. Sorry, no, go ahead. Did you try to use gum as the, as the adhesive? No, you know, the, <laughs> no. I mean, we use, we use a polyvinyl acetate okay. because you know, gum is, is a plastic. Yeah. Um, so we just found something that was compatible, and you know, it, sometimes the, they will make gum paintings uh, um, that are very heavy, and the gum will start to pull away from the canvas. And we worked very early on, like to change some of the canvases, and I mean, just the ground layer, how many times to sand it. I mean, we worked together to put panels behind to make them sturdier, so that they would last, so they wouldn't bounce, and the gum would stay on. And then we found something that would work, but we only do that as. A, you know, to help sort of finish off the works if they are changing to, like, you know, going to be unstable. Yeah. But um, we don't go in while they're making it to, like, do anything else. And um, But a lot of the substrates, like, the, that's a, a lot of what we've done together has yeah, been just, like, true. about the sort of the, the supports of these um, these paintings. And Yeah, before I started, the kind of final group of them was yeah. when we met, before the Albright Knox show, and, yeah. and we, we built all those stretches, like, kind of yeah. according to, to a lot of your guidance. That's right, yeah. yeah, and really to stop the flopping was the big... Yeah, I mean, things would move, and they would the just, you know, it's like just a vibration and movement. It was not good for these works, so... It's, we it's interesting to me, else. because in, in a sense, with these works, the, the support is the last sort of vestige of traditional painting that you've held on to is a sort of traditional painting stretcher and a canvas, and then everything else isn't painting anymore, mm -hmm. which, you know, comes back to the question of sort of what is painting? You're, you know, you're talking about these things as paintings, but, you know, it, as conservators, we have one definition of paintings, right. and yeah, you yeah, have, yeah. have a definition of paintings. That yeah, I use the term loosely. I mean, uh, you know, I call, I call all these works, paint, like, you know, uh, the, the paintings, uh, different, different series of paintings, but uh, at the same time, you know, like if, uh, like, well, I'm much more interested in, 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 that, in, in the kind of sculptural qualities of them and the illusionistic qualities of them and in, in, in what makes, I'm more interested in what makes them more than paintings, you know, so it's funny that, I, that I've chosen to, to almost simplify them with that kind of, kind of title, but hopefully maybe in, in that simplification people will kind of ask the question that, um, yeah. Um, so this, this is a mock-up that, um, that we made in my studio. We chewed some gum, and every day, everybody who chewed gum would make a little, it's very small, it's only about this big. But this we made in 2015, and I covered half of it uh, with tin foil to block the light. And after three years, it actually didn't change very much. And it's been in a lot of light. I have like very bright skylights. Um, but the humidity, and the temperature in our studio is very consistent, very controlled, and with 
all of Dan's works that have come to us, the gum paintings that were doing some, that were very active outside of our space, when they would come in, they would just be fine. <laughs> and so that taught us a lot about um, the parameters that, that need to be explained to people who have the works in order to, I mean, yes, they're going to change, but you can slow down that change. Um, you can kind of like, it doesn't have to happen in a day. It can be extended by actually just paying attention to the climate that they live yeah, in. Yeah, it's funny actually, like I, 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 I thought not to, to bitch about uh, collectors, but like <laughs> this, is, this is, I think this is actually helpful and, and relevant, just the, uh, the uh, you know, how true it's become. You know, my, my studio spent many, you know, paintings started coming back because they were, they were um, or, you know, coming, coming to Suzanne or, you know, coming to conservators because they were, um, uh, dripping, and and you know they, it would it always it would it would always happen in the spring or summer and um, and then there are a couple ones where these pieces fall off because there's a couple of moments um, and so um, you know we, we at that point you know that was a few years after we we had made them my studio started really being like you know like what like like let's go back through everything like really trying really hard to figure out like all the factors anything anything at work. And you know, as Suzanne said, like you know, we used hundreds of kinds of gum. We 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 boiled it down in so many different ways with water, with steam, you know, with 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 microwaves, different temperatures, really high temperatures, lower temperatures, turning it into liquid, turning it into like kind of more of a clay, play-doh kind of thing. You know, there were so many variables, but we really like really searched for these like w what you know what could it be? How could we control it? And like, I, it's just like, you know, 10 years later, it's just like, if you keep the humidity at the right level, level. they will not change. Yeah. And people just like refuse to like accept that or like refuse to like accept that. Like if you open a door in May and leave it open for an hour, your humidity is gonna totally, totally and completely change. And then my painting will totally and completely change. And I had, we had one, one collector who had one painting and it was that every day, and it didn't get direct sun except one time of the day, and I had to send someone to like investigate the entire, like where this person lived, where the sun hit, and the sun would like hit a window across the street and come in every day and hit a spot on the painting, but it was like super hot, it was out in California, and you know, that spot was changing every day, and they were like, no. Everything and it was it was a little humid, but but it was just you know trying to figure out like what it is that you have to change to live with an artwork. It's not just about these works; it's about all artworks. People who have works on paper who like leave the curtains open all day and then they're like, but it faded, you know. Like there's just a lot a lot of education that has to happen and um, a lot of figuring out what that might be, but the humidity for these paintings is clearly mm -hmm. an issue, no matter what gum he right. was using or how they made them. This you have to. Tur this is yeah. the video, which we can put on and talk about a little. This um, is just uh, for your entertainment. Yeah, this I is for your that. entertainment. <laughs> although it does combine the bird shit, <laughs> the the um, the gum. So this painting was in an exhibition, and uh, part of the exhibition, Dan has this uh, large, you, you can tell him, but this big nest with these birds, and then there were crack pipe curtains that kept, pretty much kept the birds outside, but they, f you know, away from the gum paintings, but they figured out how to open the curtains, and they would come through, and they would land on the painting and eat the gum, and, um, <laughs> You know, they perched up there. They they were just <laughs> super happy. You know, I mean, as anyone would be with a big sugary, yummy painting. Um, and I arrived just to in, to help like with the deinstallation, and um, I got there, and I was like, oh my god, he would love this, and I loved it. But at the same time, I thought, oh god, now I have to clean this <laughs> because you know they were doing their business uh, on the top of the painting. But um, and you know, a lot of gum was eaten, not a huge amount on such a big painting, but still, you know, they handed me like a little bag of pieces and I left a <laughs> bag of pieces and we were able to put some things back. But, you know, again, like this was sort of a, a moment as a conservator to think like, this is what I do now. Um, and, um, but it's, it's fun. It was a real, uh, 
you know, worlds colliding kind of moment. <laughs> right. um, colliding. We really blocked it off pretty good, and for like three weeks, there oh was yeah. no problem. But once they figured out how to get oh in, yeah. every morning the staff would come in and they'd be, <laughs> <laughs> they'd be eating the gum. Yeah, there'd be like a doorman, like one oh one bird God. holding open the you know the, uh. the things, and they'd go. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else got me. It might have been you got me great videos. Those sculptures with the bird shit on them were in the room also, and there's a lot of the birds just <laughs> hanging out on top of those sculptures. <laughs> it's pretty. Funny. Going right. from yeah. there to the gum paintings. <laughs> all together. Uh, this is all Bright Knox, yeah? This is, is that what this Yeah, these is? are gum paintings yeah. in, a, in, a, in a museum. Yeah. In all Bright Knox. So all Bright Knox. So, you know, and that's also been, you know, I mean, it's been a, th you know, uh, the, like Albright owns that. Albright owns that uh, painting, but I know that, like, uh, other gum paintings have gone under, like, to the boards, uh, to the kind of through the review process of museums, and it's, you know, it's a conversation at the, at the least, if not a... Um, you know, some people I think don't want to get involved. But, but it is uh, probably the safest place. I mean, most museums are climate controlled and actually they will last, which is what I tell them. Like, yeah. that's a good home for them. Um, not the Hamptons and someone's, you know, beach right. house so much right. with the doors open or, or Mi Beirut or, or Miami. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about these? Um, yeah, I mean, th th this was me in a, in a, in, in a sense uh, kind of coming back to oil painting, but really, really trying to kind of stay very close to. Um, kind of like the uh, kind of like this same ideas uh, I had about about uh, how you know allowing the material to drive the content as opposed to the content driving the material I guess and allowing you know and um, you know I think this is, uh, something I meant to say with the gun paintings is like the 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 paintings the, the, you know, the, the, the fact that the, the paintings are about the same thing that they're made out of, you know, and just like introducing that idea to, a, you know, a collector or a conservator or like, you know, that was like, that's the point, like they, they, they're about what they're made of. So, um, you know, it, it's just a big difference. And so then they have to kind of unravel in the way in which they do. Which, which, which doesn't unravel the art, it just unravels the bubble gum. And the art kind of like, like I think a Mondrian kind of like develops as it does in time and history and whatever. So this, you know, uh, like today I'm making kind of like even more kind of traditional oil paintings. I'm, 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 I'm kind of like doing a lot of kind of image based uh, kind of uh, very like really m more traditional techniques than ever. A lot of glazing and they're all landscape paintings. But this is kind of like me coming back to painting and I'm really trying to use the oil paint in, in a similar way to, to, to how I did with the traditional materials. We're really kind of like almost following the paint. It's what I did with the gum is I really follow the gum as opposed to in the past I would really try to make the paint follow me. And in a way I really wanted to see what the paint could do. And so, um, you know, again, like I was, you know, I'm trying, like I, I, I was still kind of like in that same mode of thought so I'm trying to like marry the process the material and the content and the idea of like calling the miracle paintings making the pictures look like they're of kind of miracles and using the material in this way where really it was you know it was it, I would come back it was like I was set up so that I would come back in the morning and it would be different than I left it because we were using so much material and and, and it would kind of spread out and things would blend together and things would soften and so other things would crisp in and you know there was a lot of control but there was also a lot of alchemy and um, so uh, the white is like a dust you know is a, pig is a pure pigment dust and, and, and it, I'm mostly using oil and pigment separately is what's happening mm -hmm. very little tube paint and um, and so Suzanne yeah. maybe you can talk about so that. we um, when when these are made, the uh, the dry pigment is sprinkled in as they're layering, and at the end there's some loose pigment. Um, most of the time it stays bound, but we started working on these because this one uh, the paint the pigment was trickling down still. So we had to figure out um, a system for consolidating for like setting the dry pigment without adding something that would change how it looked, which we wanted it to. You know, we wanted to maintain what they l had as the finished, at the moment that it was done with, you know, things looking very matte and powdery in some areas. And often if you add, you know, an adhesive or a consolidant to these things, you make them glossy or they look bound up. So we did a lot of tests to consolidate, and that was how we first started working on this series of paintings. So we, we were able to then clean off anything that 
trickle down and, and set everything in place so that as the painting moved around, you wouldn't have this sprinkling down, this continuous movement of the art. And then I think in the next slide, so uh, in order to do that, we made another mock-up. We This is like our thing, is to make mock-ups. Um, and we had um, some of Dan's assistants come and bring the materials and teach us, you know, kind of show us what they did and then we make our own and we have like, there are little um, triangles on that which are the our little test information saying like what adhesive we used and how we applied it um, and those are their materials and we have like a little chart. So, um, you know, for us it becomes like very scientific and very uh, like problem solving um, to to make a little mini version. Um, occasionally with other projects, the studio has made us our own mini versions of things, which is great. Um, but again, like if we do it, then we kind of can see how the work is made and all the layers um, that go into it. Um, and then with some of these paintings, what started to happen is they would become um, a very dust attractive and have a sort of bloom that formed on the surface. And um, we, we would clean them periodically um, when they were in exhibitions or going on loan. Um, and at a certain point, if you go to the next yeah. slide, um, Dan and I discussed varnishing them or you know, trying to figure out a way to stop this bloom, which I think is part of the, the, one of the mediums that he was using was sort of causing this. So these are all our mock-ups. Um, this is um, a work that we are cleaning of this kind of ha it became they became very hazy and that's not was not his intent and although we've talked about this right the change is part of a lot of things this change was not a, a change that he wanted so we um, did a lot of tests and have spent years um, kind of trying to find the right way to clean them and then varnish them to get back to the surface that was close to what they looked like, right? Not mm -hmm. day one, but maybe mm -hmm. day 11. Mm -hmm. And and watch it to see that, and we do, would do tests where we would expose them to very high humidity, high heat, a lot of light, all different things to try to get that bloom to come back. And so far, two years, we, so far, so good. Um, but it's been a challenge because um, every painting is made a little differently, so everyone respond, each responds a bit differently, um, but I think we have a, a sort of a system now. Um, so that's been a very, like, that's an, a project that's still going on, but one that's been, I think, pretty successful. Yeah, and us. that's been really fun to kind of, like, dialogue together, and it's really in your hands in a way, but, um, and uh, I think we, we had talked about, you know, there's uh, just kind of, you know, to describe an, another difference with working with a, with a living artist, you know, you were in my studio looking at gum paintings as I was making those. We didn't know, think we'd be working on them together, but you saw what they looked like when they were just finished or when they were in process. And, and that obviously gives you a different kind of edge into kind of like helping uh, uh, conserve them, helping, you know, make other kind of like decisions yeah. about how to, um, how to um, just, uh, Kind of protect them. Yeah, I mean, for my assistants, you know, a lot of them ha had never seen the works when they were made, these miracles. Um, but I did, so I, when I get to the point where I'm like, oh, that looks like where we should be. We should not, it not, shouldn't be more glossy, shouldn't be this matte, you know, go back in and spray it one more time. I mean, we have a lot of, you know, things going on to try to get it to the right level, but I have to be the eyes, and, and then Dan will come in and say, yes, this looks right, but at least I have some sense of like what what they were aiming for when they were made. And they're very beautiful, very saturated, kind of interesting surfaces um, with this very dry part as well. So like everything had to be maintained. Um. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, even, you know, there's just so many considerations. I mean, it, in, a, in a way, it contradicts a lot of things that I said before, but I mean, maybe that's my goal in general uh, with making art is to always contradict myself. But no, in this case, um, it didn't seem relevant to to any of my intentions, to the to, the, to any of the themes of the work. To um, it was basically, you know, I was using a bunch of materials that I'd never used in a very kind of wild, uh, experimental way, and um, you know, several months later, they started uh, uh, having these these kind of side effects and. Um, and it was, it was, I feel fortunate that, that I had um, 
you know, somebody who has an as deep a dialogue as with Suzanne to consider how to, you know, they were finished works that then I had to essentially say, well, I, they, they, they weren't finished. Like we were going to have to figure out really how to finish them because they, they kind of like, they spun off into uh, some, something else kind of like uh, uh, s soured in the material or something. And so we had to figure out how to how to, s how to kind of stabilize them and, and uh, you know, it was like, I mean, it, it, even in a, maybe even to describe the differences, like honestly, I, I, I have, some of my work takes me very, very long to make. And so I have a lot of patience when it comes to kind of certain fabrication and some paintings I've worked on for many, many years. But like, it's, it's a different, it's still a different working style. And like, I don't think I could have ever figured out what she had figured out to finish these paintings, and you know, um, which is what you know, and and, and similar, where, where I work with other other fabricators that I work with, like, you know, I have patience for certain things and expertise for certain things, but um, but these other things are things that are just as important to to kind of help uh, eventually kind of characterize what's important in the work, and uh, so no, it was really really like you know fortunate that like Suzanne and I had this ongoing dialogue, and um, and she was really able to kind of understand that like. Although with the gum and the flower paintings, you know, I'm I'm very kind of like um, um, open to kind of exact to, to 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 allow whatever happened happens. In this case, it was something that was really important for me to kind of bring back to where it was when I thought I had originally finished it. And um, and I think yeah, I think we we did it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I don't know how much more time <laughs> we yeah. have. We have a well. lot of things we want. We can. We can go, these are the flower the paintings. Um, these are made uh, by smashing uh, flowers into uh, very fragile canvas. Um, and so in this project, we uh, some, sometimes holes would be made as they made <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. the paintings. And I, I suggested, well, why don't you put something underneath? So, you know, it's a cushion, so, and there's no, <laughs> they liked, you know, taking their bowling pins and, you know, mallets or whatever and doing it. So uh, for some of the paintings that had larger holes, we came in. This, these are just um, patches that haven't been actually, like, when they're on, you don't see them anymore. And these are little, well, again, papers. But that's you can like see the that's the tear. And, and then the tear is, you know, is put back together. But I, I, I thought it was actually very... Um, sort of non-responsible but thoughtful that, you know, they, they didn't send these paintings out in the world with these tears that could propagate, that could get worse. So, you know, we did something that was very minimal and kind of invisible in the end. But um, we would come into the studio and, and add these little mens, um, which is just typical conservation. Um, if you go on and... Uh, these are the mail orders, which um, are silk screened paintings. Um, and this was a project we did together because um, the these are, when you silk screen a work and you stretch a work, it's like working on any older painting that's made where you unstretch it and restretch it. So you don't have a, a, a blank canvas that's stretched and then you screen on it. The, the screen is on there. So um, I've worked on many, many Warhols and many other um, artworks that are screened, but with uh, particularly with Warhols that um, there were many left after Warhol died, and they needed to be stretched, and that still happens even now. We're still still stretch some. Um, you have to have a certain kind of understanding of how to very carefully stretch something without damaging the paint. And so, for the first paintings that were made in this series, a lot of them um, were damaged by the people stretching them because they just. You know, it's not something that other people know how to do, um, but conservators do. Uh, so they ended up coming to us, and um, we would actually just get them straight from the, the printer and, and make sure that the stretcher was exactly the right size, that we had exactly the right border. Um, and so, you know, then we didn't have to, you know, restore any damages. We just stretched them up, and then they would go back. So we became sort of part of the process a little bit in this. Yeah, I think this series. is kind of like unique, maybe for your studio. And and actually, hearing you now makes me realize, actually, like makes me kind of understand it a little better. You know, like it, it, they're large paintings; they're about ten feet tall. And I know, I mean, I've had this experience where. Uh, collectors have unstretched my paintings, and I hate that, but I understand that it happens when you have a 16-foot uh, painting. T to, I've had to restretch some of those that, like, the, 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 the difference between what happens on the 
face of the canvas and what happens on the side of the canvas is an important part of the artwork to me. And it's almost impossible on that scale to get it right again. Um, and, um, and with these paintings, again, it was like, it was uh, really important for me that, that a, a very, very small amount, but a very exact amount of the image kind of curled over to the side of the canvas and that it was really even across and it's just r really challenging to do and, you, and the, only, the only people who really have experience like um, you know putting back together old delicate uh, paintings are conservators and uh, yeah so so they were kind of getting ruined and and uh, Suzanne and her team took over the whole project which was kind of like mm -hmm. lengthy and I really did see it as like that was finishing the paintings in a way because they're kind of object E for me. Yeah. So this is them in a show I just had this May. So beautiful. Oh, we, we could skip we over. We talked a bit about yeah. the star and feathers, although you I'm sure we could talk yeah. a lot more. Oh, and okay, so I want to talk about yeah, these because so I love she them so She much. loves these. <laughs> 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 nice to hear that. I like that. Yeah. Um, so these are stud paintings that are made by, uh, by basically like inserting these metal studs into canvas um, and they're, as Dan they're, they're like the studs from uh, like a punk rock jacket yeah. and we, we, we put them on in the same way essentially you would mm -hmm. you know I, do, I think there's that that kind of comparison with the um, with the gum paintings where we're really like using the material as it as it's as it's asked to be used we're not trying to refine it or turn it we're not trying to turn it into anything else than it was just and I only mentioned because like uh, I think when somebody studs a jacket, like they try to be meticulous, but sometimes you know they miss a stud. Maybe they had a couple of drinks or something like that. I don't <laughs> know about those guys, but like, um, anyways, you know, some studs fall out, and like, and I think that that's like okay for these paintings for mm -hmm. some studs to fall out because we put in thousands of studs, and you kind of it's kind of blinding, and so. Um, but that's like it, it's kind of like a side note, just to just to kind of like the evolution of the paintings and how I kind of see see the way in which they kind of develop and how it's connected to the kind of the theme of the material or something like that. I think there's a picture coming up. Oh, no, this is not it. But there's one of them. Make oh, this it. is maybe this a is here. Uh, no, you can no. go back. Um, sorry, we had one somewhere. But uh, so so what happened with these is that they are incredibly heavy. And uh, the first stretchers were breaking. Um, so we we came in and and together with the stretcher maker that we work with that we work with as conservators and that Dan works with as an artist um, Simon Liu he's a very good stretcher maker and he, his team and and we worked really hard together with Dan seemed to like come up with something that would support the art that wouldn't in itself weigh an mm. extra ton I mean one of the paintings is what 200 inches long it they were very heavy and um, but then what started so we we designed the stretchers together we came up with something uh, that worked and then we found that because we had designed something that had like a, a very smooth surface underneath the canvas that there was nothing for the canvas to really hold on to and the paintings were starting to sort of like billow out from the weight at the bottom so we we did this project uh, together where they made me a very small one and I had to kind of figure out what I could do to attach it in a way that would not be, that would work on this little scale and then work for something 200 inches long. So um, we came up with this bolt system where we took out a stud and we back, basically backed it with a little bolt and we drilled holes and then we put them back in and you can't see where they are on the front. Um, but on the back, they're they're held in and they are put periodically on. So in the next one, I think there are bigger ones. So here, this is like one of the very large ones getting stretched up, and then here we've we've done this this, and and I think this has worked out really uh, yeah, well. And really we didn't well make the, the thousands sort of, of little bolts. We just made a manual after we figured it out, gave it to the studio, and they they made. Um, uh, yeah. They made them. I don't um, even know what would have happened to that thing had somebody would have gotten hurt. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, somebody would have gotten <sighs> hurt. Um, That's so one installed. Over that there. is one installed. So sadly, I think we're running out of time yes, because I, think I could so. listen to you guys talk all night. <laughs> but maybe we have time for a couple of questions. If sure. If you're up for it. If anybody I has any. Nothing too difficult. From the audience. Yes, Jay. Mm 
mm -hmm. but how much is you know coming straight from the studio um, either while you're making the project and discovering these issues or if it's been in your studio for a few years um, you know as a result of that at that period of time I'm just I, curious I think we work on more at this point we work more on things that we're working on together um, but um, but when something is damaged, then um, often the studio will be contacted, bef and then they'll send them to me. But uh, sometimes they go; th things do go to other conservators. Um, but uh, I haven't had that many things. I think it's more that people need to talk to me about how they should take care of what they are buying. Um, and or, or whatever a museum is is collecting, so I so I'm just like this resource um, at this point. But I haven't, I don't have like, I have many more works by other artists um, that are are damaged than than actually by by Dan. It's more that we work to make the works sort of safer going out into the world, or you know, right. revisit I, things that have gone like out. You're an integral part of Dan's process, uh, uh, you know, on some of these more complex things to make sure that. They can go out into the world. Safely. Yeah, I think that I saw at, in some of these earlier earlier interactions with Suzanne when um, you know she was getting contacted by a collector and then calling me. We didn't really know each other, and I you know I saw her interest and I saw her her kind of like sensitivity to m my project, you know, and um, and I, I, I you know it didn't happen. It didn't it didn't occur to me in in one meeting, but I realized like how, how, how just great an asset it would be to develop a dialogue with one person, especially somebody who is as interested as, as Suzanne, Suzanne was, because, you know, even just like the, the, the one dialogue that I have with a collector who is concerned about an artwork is like, is like a lot, it's a, it's a big distraction at least from, from what I'm trying to work on in the moment, you know? And um, you know to have to to help like to to help um, uh, like uh, identify like an expert you know and uh, you know we tell all of our all of my collectors that you know if they have any you know questions that like Suzanne's really the best person to answer them and and it just like I I didn't you know it's not something that I thought of before meeting Suzanne but it's just such a gr an amazing thing to have that that dialogue with somebody who really becomes the expert of how to kind of like uh, care for these things you know and um, and so and so then yeah I think that uh, as Suzanne was saying you know now it's more I'm, I'm really trying to preempt any of that stuff because it's just it just it just uh, you know you really, I really want to kind of stay away from 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 those uh, interactions and um, and then, and then, but but also just just hope that like Suzanne and I have a kind of clear left dialogue. So when there are problems, you know, it's like a simple simple thing. Everybody knows where to go. And unfortunately, they don't always go to her, as we mentioned. But um, <laughs> yeah. Any other That's questions? Mark. <laughs> sure. You can refuse to answer this question, but uh, if you're willing to engage with the work of another artist, two years ago Robert Gober came and, and had this podium, and there's an artist who is, is very specifically about recreating something that might we might consider as ephemeral in something non-ephemeral. And you're very much about, I want to use gum, I don't want to, I don't want to make a um, well, I don't want to substitute for gum. Right. What can is there any way that you could um, compare the two of your approaches? Yeah, and I mean, I don't think that 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 what I'm trying to do with with gum defines my whole practice. Also, you know, um, um, you know, I make uh, sculptures out of steel. I work with robotics. I, you know, I, I do a lot of different things, and and um, they all come with their own set of horrible challenges. You know that like. You know, you get 75% of the way through it, and you realize that, like, you might, you might, you may be able to finish it, but can you? But how will it, how will it hold up once it's not yours anymore? You know, and um, um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, Suzanne and I, we were we were just talking about uh, Christian, who came here with Gober, and who I've worked with really closely also in the past, and who's who's a really great guy, and. Um, 
you know, the, I think the, uh, uh, the project that I'm most familiar of, or the pro I know like how they got started working together, which was trying to like make a real donut, stay a real donut, but not spoil, right? And so the difference here is like, uh, I think, you know, because Gobert does like using real materials, I think, and he seems to, you know, at the time he was interested in trying to figure out how to, how to make it last forever. And, like, I think they injected it they with some side of kind of, like... And I think they, like they freeze-dried the potatoes, and I think they were all different. Right, so, so and, and, and I, I have projects that are more comparable to that, where I'm trying to um, kind of, like, take an object out of the real world and almost try to figure out how to put it in a vacuum. You know, that is something I'm interested in. I'm interested in the dialogue around things... Um, um, things... Uh, you know, changing or not changing, you know, and I think with, with these gum paintings, because it's such a kind of base, you know, material, just because it's so every day, and because, like, it comes out of our mouths, and it gets left under desks, and, and um, you know, the narrative that comes with it, because it's this thing from our childhood, but, like, you know, it's this other thing that we, like, you know, we really kind of, like, it's, we use out of boredom, or out of habit, or out of anxiety, or out of these things, like, I just felt all those narratives worked really well and kind of like just like putting it there. And, 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 um, and you know, like at the time I was exploring a lot of ideas about like f the fragility of life, you know, and, but like I was trying to, to do it through these themes that seemed more about like celebration or fun, you know, I was making these paintings uh, of confetti, but I really f always felt like they were about death. And, you know, just with, 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 um, with these paintings, I think there was, a, or, you know, with these, with the gum works, I feel like there was a kind of similar uh, kind of conceptual interest in just taking this thing that kind of came out of childhood that was really just like a very kind of playful thing and watching it, you know, kind of like a, watching it transform, you know, watching it deteriorate in certain ways and, and um, you know, and um, so, uh, you know, and but um, but in general, I'm not sure if I could give a great great explanation of uh, you know um, the differences in our practices. Um. But I want to say those those gum paintings are very experiential. So when we have them in the studio, and when you would have one say in a small room, they smell like the gum, and you experience the gum, and you have memories of maybe last week, but maybe when you were a child. Um, and I think that that's something that you would not get if you made imitation gum it's well, just there's more to it than, yeah it was definitely you know. like not about sanitizing the work because it was yeah. about going under the desk and picking up that 10 year old piece of gum it was about going into like you know the the like weird little little spot that everybody collected in the bathroom or in the woods where you know you'd leave it and have this kind of like old decrepit um uh stuff and and, and the smell is a is a big, a big part of it and the dripping is a big part of it and the kind of like l l you know, the, like, I mean, well, what's really happening as it's deteriorating is you get a sense that it's alive, right? And so, like, so it's not actually, you know, it, like, if it wasn't deteriorating, you'd think of it more as a dead object in a way or a lifeless object, but it's dripping, it's sweating, it's crying, it's like whatever, it's moving. Um, and that, that, like, really interested in me for, for this with, with just such a kind of like a base material, you know. Any other questions? No. This one here. Here she comes. Oh, is my question on the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you could comment on how you view your, your position, excuse me, your position in relation to the art market versus com to the artist. Um, I have to be sort of between everybody. Um, and that there was this slide that we had, which was like the stakeholders. Um, you know, I mean, because I'm in a, in a private practice, of course I work a lot of the time f within the market for the auction houses, for private collectors, for dealers. Um, and I do have to, I mean, most of the time, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I try to be very balanced and very, um, I don't know, just stay in a place where I'm just telling the truth because I often work for the buyer and the seller. And this has come with time. Like in the beginning when I started, maybe I'd be like, oh, I want to make this person sort of happy or I want to like make everything sound rosy and beautiful. But at the end of the day and very early on, I learned that I can't do that because 
you know, I could have both people as clients, both the gallery selling the bubblegum painting, the person buying the bubblegum painting, the artist who made the painting. So I just have to be very clear about all the things I know. But I do think that once we had a relationship that I know more about, you know, how to have that painting, how to own it or how to take care of it. So I'm not going to tell you not to buy it, but I'm going to tell you that you shouldn't put it somewhere that it's going to deteriorate, how to maintain it. So that's my job is sort of to balance that out. It isn't always easy to be in the market, but it's what I do every day now. So um, I've gotten used to just having to stand my ground and say, you know, um, those cracks are there on uh, Joan Mitchell, but they belong on that Joan Mitchell. And I have to do a lot of work every day to understand what is normal for an artist's work, both when it was made and then as it's aged and what's sort of typical. Um, and you know, my name's on lots and lots of reports for people buying art. Um, and I have to just be sure that I'm hopefully almost always right. I'm sure there are times when I'm, I misread something, but in general, you know, I think I do a lot of homework to make sure that I'm just kind of telling it like it is. And I can't predict always you know, how something will age, but I'm, I'm not gonna be that person who tells you that a Rothko is going to fade because it's a Rothko. It's not gonna happen if you take care of it correctly. And, and there are people out there who say like, oh, this is just has inherent vice, this thing will you know, fail. But it is really about caretaking most of the time. And so I think I'm just there as like an educator also to like help everybody know what they're doing. Whether or not a gallery tells a potential person what they're buying, that's not up to me. So it's very much up to people to know, to contact conservators and to have one that is your conservator looking out for you. Um, a lot of people rely on like an auction house, you know, maybe a specialist wrote the, you know, it's not really a conservator writing those, those conservation, those, you know, reports, condition reports. So it's important to bring in someone that you trust. Thank you so much. I think we're probably out of time. Thank yeah. you, Dan and Suzanne. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah.